I do still see a few people joining, but we'll go ahead and, and get started. Uh, welcome. You are here for the eMedApps MedTech Solutions Company webinar. Uh, we are talking about the top eight steps to include in your successful EHR downtime plan. Today, our presenter is Vic Shashadre. He's our VP of Product Development. And a few housekeeping. Um, you are in listen only mode. There is a questions box at the bottom of your menu. Feel free to submit any questions during the webinar. We will save those towards the end. And if we don't have time, we will make sure that you do get a follow up. Uh, but again, feel free to submit those as we are going through. You will also get a copy of the uh, presentation, a link to the recording at a later date. So uh, be looking for that in email as well. All right, here's a, a little bit of info about us. Uh, again, this is eMedApps, and we are now a part of the MedTech Solutions Company. We are practice-centered, so you can be patient-focused. Our IT services resolve around your unique needs, your patients, your providers, and your business. And with that, let me pass the presentation on to Vic, so we can go ahead and delve down into the info. Thanks a lot, Holly. You're welcome. Okay, so let's get started here today. Um, I think probably uh, the appropriate title or may have been the top eight steps to navigating a downtime event. So what we're going to talk about here is uh, what are the things that I need to do as an organization uh, so that I'm prepared for and can deal with uh, an outage of my uh, EHR environment. And we're going to break these into the different steps uh, that you need to do uh, in order to prepare for it ahead of time, deal with it when it's occurring, and uh, deal with it after it's complete. Uh, and so it sort of goes from the beginning to the end and what uh, to expect in that in that downtime. So we'll start uh, by talking about what planning I need to be doing before uh, my downtime event occurs. And what are the things that I need to implement uh, before that downtime event? What is the, the things I need to think about when I'm when I'm talking about testing for the downtime? Uh, what are the communication strategies that I need to think about for uh, that occur when the downtime event is is happening? How do I deal with data during that downtime? How do I deal with documentation and billing during the downtime? And then once my downtime is complete, how do I roll back to my EHR? I, the uh, the downtime creates an abrupt need. Uh, to move to downtime procedures, but how do I gracefully go back to using my EHR once the downtime is complete? And then finally, closing the loop on everything, updating information back into my EHR after the downtime. What are the things I need to be thinking about uh, when I design that process? So let's jump right in, and we'll start with uh, my planning before the downtime. Uh, so in order to come up with a uh, good uh, downtime plan, I need to first think about what are the different types of downtime events that I could experience. And so to do this, we break those downtime events into two categories, what we call planned and unplanned downtimes. Pretty self-explanatory. So the planned downtime events are things that I have control over. Uh, they could be hardware-related uh, downtime. I need to update my server. I need to update my uh, my network uh, switch, whatever those items might be, uh, but this is going to require me to bring down my application as a process. Um, these kind of events, you generally have a lot of control over the timing of the of the uh, uh, downtime. So, uh, with that, you can generally account for these hardware type downtimes based purely on the schedule. All right, I can schedule this to occur at a time where the impact is going to be minimal to none. Uh, to my environment, maybe it's in the middle of the night when none of my uh, backup processes or any other uh, server jobs are running so that uh, I can bring the systems down, uh, initiate that hardware update, and then bring everything back up uh, and my users uh, wouldn't notice anything. On the software side, there could be uh, planned downtimes associated with that as well. And one uh, key uh, piece of information here is we should never let software update downtime be a reason to not update the software. So we often run into groups that are three, four, five versions back on their EHR software because they don't want to do a downtime event to update the software. And this creates a vicious circle for them because number one, 
it makes that downtime event longer when it eventually has to happen because now I'm so far behind, I'm almost like re-implementing my, uh, my EHR. Uh, and then number two, it leaves you open to potential issues, maybe some security concerns, depending on uh, your EHR uh, environment um, that I really should be addressing on an ongoing basis. And so if you have a robust enough downtime plan, uh, you can certainly account for these planned software uh, downtimes uh, uh, due to uh, um, updates to my software so that you're not falling behind. You're keeping yourself up to date for regulatory purposes, for security purposes, and for operational purposes, because with every new update, I'm going to get new features and benefits in that system that could help me out, could it, could improve my workflow, could enable uh, the practice to run more smoothly. So we certainly don't want uh, the update process itself uh, to be a detriment to upgrading the software. So we want to make sure that it's not going to create any issues with, with the downtime. So we have a plan in place or if it does require me to be down for an entire weekend, for example, I have a robust enough downtime in place that I can continue my normal weekend operations when that, when that uh, uh, update is occurring. So those are my, my planned outages and, uh, and those are great because I know they're coming. I can uh, put processes in place and deal with them. The ones that get you are the unplanned ones, right? I'm not prepared for it. Something happened and I'm unable to get into my EHR. So the first thing you need to think about are what are the most likely sources uh, for this downtime? Where are my most likely points of failure? If uh, I have my EHR that's cloud hosted or it's sitting in a private cloud environment, um, what, are, what are my most logical points of failure where I'm not gonna be able to access the system? Uh, normally in that scenario, it's my network access, right? I'm unable to connect to the cloud or the private cloud and so I'm unable to get to my EHR. Uh, if my EHR infrastructure sits within my uh, data center, what are my most uh, common points of failure that I need to be aware of? So by understanding what are, are the biggest causes of failure, that can drive your downtime plan in order to deal with it. So you can kind of figure out, number one, what's the likelihood of that failure occurring? Number two, uh, if that failure occurs, what are the locations that are most likely to be affected? So if my uh, infrastructure is sitting within the data center at one of my locations, right, and my most likely point of failure is communication between my locations, well, my, my location where the data center sits is pretty secure. I'm not going to have to worry about uh, uh, the, that communication outage causing a problem there. But instead, I'm going to have to focus on those other locations where I do have that problem and what are the solutions that I need to put in place at those other locations so that they can be functional uh, in the event that that communication failure occurs. You can tailor your plan uh, to mo cover the most likely sources and locations, right? So uh, I don't want to try to create a plan that can work for any possible issue because you can't, you don't know all the things that are gonna be happening, um, but I can certainly tailor the plan to deal with the most likely uh, causes of failure and then uh, deal with the other ones as they come along. This will allow you to invest your dollars more wisely, right? You can put your uh, uh, dollars where you're likely to see the most impact. Um, you don't want to kind of deal with every possible scenario equally and spread your dollars around to kind of deal with all of the possible events that occur. You want to kind of hit and focus your attention on the things that are most likely to happen so that uh, that you can get the most bang for your buck at the end of the day. You certainly can't have a solution to deal with every possible scenario, but you could have solutions to deal with 95% of the things that might occur. Uh, and that 5% wildcard will go back to rely on uh, sort of your generic processes when, when dealing with that. Some other additional areas to think about once I've figured out what my most likely sources of downtime are, uh, other things that I need to, uh, to think about when putting my plan together is uh, communication. How do I uh, reach out to my staff to let them know that there's an outage or there's an outage occurring if it's planned uh, so that we have uh, the opportunity to let them know that the downtime workflow is being put into place? What is that notification mechanism? How susceptible is that notification mechanism to my downtime scenario, right? So if you're relying on 
electronic communication uh, in my most likely downtime scenarios is that electronic communication going to go down how am i going to communicate with my staff uh, in these scenarios so you got to come up with that plan and then from the the visit itself how is my workflow going to be affected uh, by uh, this change in process to deal with the downtime uh, how will patients flow through my clinic uh, during the check-in process what am i going to do uh, to do patient balance lookup to collect copays and patient payments. Uh, when I'm triaging the patients, how are my medical staff going to review histories and capture vitals? During the visits themselves, how are my providers going to be able to review the histories, review the previous visit notes, chart their current visit notes? And then on checkout, how am I going to create follow-up appointments for this patient? So what's my process for doing that? They don't all have to be electronic processes. They all don't have to be uh, uh, handled in the downtime scenario. So you may decide that, you know what, I'll just have my patients call back in to do their follow-up appointments if there's a downtime. That could be your, your downtime policy for follow-up appointments, right? If that makes sense for your organization, then that's certainly uh, a valid uh, a procedure to put in place. But you kind of need to think about what am I going to do uh, in all of these different scenarios uh, in order to have that patient flow through the clinic, right? We don't want uh, the patient to get stuck somewhere because we haven't thought about what we're going to do to deal with this patient uh, in this scenario. All right, so once I've come up with that uh, that thought process, I've got an idea of um, uh, what uh, what I want to do uh, to deal with this downtime. I need to get those pro uh, procedures and policies in place, right? We don't want to wait till there's a downtime to try to stand something up if there's a software solution or a uh, tools that need to be put in place. I want to make sure I have those implemented in my environment and I'm ready to deal with that downtime when it occurs. Um, so I need to, to make sure I've documented the process that'll use, be used by each role so everybody knows what they need to do to complete their tasks. Uh, I need to deploy any new technology solutions. Uh, uh, if I have a uh, downtime solution, that I need to put in place. I need to make sure that's deployed uh, and put into place. If it's a manual uh, process for dealing with downtime, uh, I'm creating chart extracts for all the patients that are scheduled the next day or in the next two days, whatever that, uh, that process you come up with is, I got to put that uh, into practice, right? Whatever I need to do to make that happen, I got to get that set up and scheduled in, in the system. I got to test that downtime process. We got to make sure that the downtime process is functional and it's working. And then I got to train my staff on that process. I got to make sure everyone knows what the expectations are, what are they supposed to be doing uh, in the event of the, down, uh, of, of the downtime. Ensure that the policy and implementation instructions are available to all in the outage. The downtime isn't something that your staff is going to be doing on a daily basis. Uh, we don't want them to be doing this on a daily basis. So we want them to be able to access Sheet notes, if you will, uh, help sheets, uh, things that'll help them deal with the process when it's time to kick that in place. Does that mean I need paper copies of this because I'm worried about an outage where they'll, they won't be able to access my intranet or my SharePoint site if that's what you're using for, uh, for document management within your organization? Uh, how do I uh, generate these paper copies, distribute them so that they're available uh, to my staff uh, in the event of an outage and they're able to reference uh, the, the workflow and the processes that need to be in place uh, during that downtime. So you got to make sure that all of this is taken care of ahead of time because you don't want, again, surprises uh, when that downtime event occurs. We talked a little bit about testing. Uh, this is critical uh, to a successful downtime policy. And so what do I need to think about when I'm uh, um, uh, planning my testing uh, for uh, for downtime events. I want to make sure I test all my processes. Right? So uh, I need to have mock downtime scenarios where my staff or my teams are accessing the technology solutions or uh, the processes that we've put in place uh, and make sure those are available to them. They're able to get into the systems they need to get into. Uh, you want each role uh, to perform their own downtime processes, make sure that the documentation is sufficient, uh, that the information that they have is is, is what they need. Uh, this should be an iterative process. You want to modify it 
based on the feedback from the testing. So you go through this mock uh, downtime, you find out that, hey, what I had in place for uh, dealing with patient check-in isn't sufficient or I need to change X, Y, and Z. Uh, then you gotta make sure you implement those changes and test it again. Make sure that, uh, that everything is occurring the way you expect it to. You wanna make sure that you're periodically testing access to downtime systems. Uh, if you are using a technology solution uh, for your downtime, you want to make sure that that's accessible. Uh, oftentimes, these things sit in the background. They're not accessed on a daily, weekly basis. And when there's a downtime, you're surprised to find out, find out that uh, uh, that your, tech, your backup solution isn't available because uh, somebody unplugged a server, for example, uh, and it's been down. So, uh, so if you put this in your plan that you're going to test these uh, systems, uh, you know, at, at least on a quarterly basis, but preferably uh, more frequently than that, uh, to make sure that you have access to the system, make sure it's up and running, and that your team can access the environment and get to everything that they need to. This is an ongoing process. This isn't a once and done thing, uh, especially when you have staff turnover. Uh, you need to make sure that everyone is is aware of what's happening with uh, with the downtime process. You might want to schedule mock downtimes periodically throughout the year so that your new staff uh, is able to go through a mock downtime scenario and deal with it. You could do this by location, by uh, by department uh, at different periods of time uh, so that it's, uh, you know, it's not a burden on the organization to be able to go through these mock events uh, and, and be able to deal with uh, any issues that arise out of them. Okay, so now I've, I've done my planning. I've implemented uh, uh, all the processes and technology that I need to implement. I've thoroughly tested everything. Uh, my uh, my process is adequate for what I need, uh, and uh, and I'm confident that the uh, the information has has been disseminated to my staff, and everybody is aware of what they need to do uh, in this downtime. And now I now I actually experience the downtime. So what am I? What is the first step that I need to take care of there? I need to communicate to my staff. Uh, that that a downtime ha event has occurred uh, and that the EHR is unavailable and that the downtime processes will be initiated. I want to make sure that everyone is aware uh, that we're moving into this downtime scenario. If there is any need to inform patients uh, that, that there's a uh, altered uh, workflow, then you need to make sure you do this at this time. So for example, uh, if you're changing your check-in process because of the downtime, uh, you used to let patients check in uh, uh, at their own department, but now because it's a downtime, you want them to check in centrally or vice versa, uh, then uh, then you need to make sure they're aware of what they need to do in the organization. That may involve signage uh, to get appropriate signage uh, displayed in the uh, uh, in the waiting rooms or wherever appropriate uh, to be able to deal with this. It may uh, involve outreach and communication to the clients if you have some sort of a patient messaging a system where you're sending patients messages for their appointments, you might be able to leverage that to send out notifications to patients. Uh, whatever is the appropriate process for the organization, you got to make sure that you are informing people of what you want them to be able to do during this downtime. You got to make sure that your access to the downtime systems are made available. Uh, oftentimes, you don't want uh, staff using these downtime systems uh, on a regular basis, so you kind of uh, make them unavailable whether that's through published icons or whatever methodology uh, the organization is using. Uh, when the downtime occurs, you got to make sure those items are available. So if there's a, a switch that needs to be flipped uh, in order for those icons to be available, any active directory work that needs to happen, whatever the, the use case might be, um, we got to make sure we initiate that so the staff has uh, accessibility to those, uh, uh, to those icons. They're able to launch the solutions uh, they need to launch if it's a uh, a, a more of a manual process. Maybe there's a, a, a PDFs that are, that have been extracted on patients' charts. We got to make sure that those are accessible uh, and the appropriate people have access to them. Uh, you got to keep staff informed during the downtime. Uh, periodic updates with expected time of restoration are very helpful, uh, so that once you've identified the cause of the downtime. You've dealt with the vendors that need to be dealt with in order to, to bring the system back in. Reach out to your staff, let them know what's going on, let them know when uh, systems will be back online. Uh, 
so they have an idea of, of how long they're going to be in this process so they can plan accordingly as well. You know, over inform versus under informing the, uh, the staff of what's happening here. Now that I've spun up those systems, uh, my staff's been made aware. Uh, what kind of uh, information do I need to make available to my to my staff during this downtime? Uh, so, when when the downtime occurs, users should switch to that downtime process uh, for data access. Uh, whatever this process is, should provide them with patients' clinical history. You certainly don't want your clinical teams and your providers. Uh, dealing with patients, seeing them without information uh, present. Uh, what kind of information is required? That's really up to the organization in terms of the type of, uh, of uh, uh, visits and the type of patients that you're, you're seeing. Uh, but you're probably thinking about things like medication histories, order histories, labs, vital signs measurements, previous visit notes are, are critically important so you can see what happened to this patient. Uh, what what occurred with the patient the last time when they were here. Oftentimes that previous visit note contains all the other information that you're interested in. It's got patient medication info, it's got order info, it's got lab info, it's got vital info. It may not be historic with everything in there, but it could be sufficient uh, for what you need to deal with. So you can kind of make a decision about whether that itself will be sufficient uh, for your for your downtime. Do I need to supplement that with any additional information that may be useful uh, to the provider. This data should be readily ac accessible. Uh, you don't want your uh, clinical staff and your providers going and hunting for information uh, uh, when, when a downtime event occurs. You certainly want to make the transition as smooth as possible. You want that information to be available to them uh, so they can continue their process and see those patients. Um, if you're using some sort of multi-factor authentication, uh, for your downtime environment, you got to make sure that that uh, multi-factor uh, is available uh, in the uh, use cases that you're talking about for your downtime. Uh, are, are people using their own cell phones with uh, authenticator apps on there for uh, for the multi-factor? What is the process uh, for your multi-factor? And make sure it fits well within your downtime scenario. But the bottom line is you want clinicians uh, to be able to make informed decisions on patient care, right? So you want to make sure uh, that all the data that they need is available to them uh, when they're when they're making these decisions on patient care. Um, now that EHR is a uh, uh, mission critical component of your daily uh, clinical experience, uh, you certainly don't want them trying to do things without access to this information. documentation and billing during the downtime. So I'm, uh, I have my system, my downtime system available. My providers are seeing patients uh, through the downtime environment. Uh, what do I need to do in regards to documentation and billing? So from a documentation perspective, you want to capture the events that occurred with the patient so that you can update your EHR when the system is restored. This could be a paper-based process. It could be an electronic process whatever makes sense for the organization. Uh, we've had organizations that have done paper forms uh, to deal with, uh, with downtime events. Some use electronic tools through their downtime systems uh, to capture information, but whatever makes sense for the organization, uh, we need to be able to deploy that. If it is a paper form-based environment, we need to make sure those forms are available uh, to our providers so they're able to capture the data in that paper environment. We got to make sure those those documents are secure uh, in, in during the downtime. I'm charting uh, PHI on the uh, uh, on those pieces of paper. If I'm using a paper-based methodology, uh, I want to make sure that there's some process in place to deal with those individual sheets of paper, um, whatever that mechanism might be for the organization that makes sense. You've gone completely electronic. You're not used to tracking uh, paper documents, so you want to make sure that you have uh, process in place to deal with that. The the security is certainly easier to accomplish with electronic notes. Uh, so if you are using electronic notes, you can generally uh, deal with the uh, the security of those documents in a much easier fashion. Uh, but it's certainly not impossible to do in a paper environment either with the appropriate uh, policies and procedures in place. You may want to think about how do I share these documents during a downtime. 
uh, depending on how your organization is set up. Uh, do you have on-call providers that are uh, fielding phone calls from patients uh, 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 during uh, uh, off hours? In which case, is there a way that I can make this documentation available to them um, that was done during the visit when the, when the patient was seen? Uh, so that if the patient does follow up and call in at the end of the day because they had a question about the prescription they just picked up, for example, uh, is there any way that that on-call provider is able to get uh, to this information? It's certainly harder if it's on paper, uh, easier to accomplish in an electronic world uh, in being able to have them get access to that uh, documentation. Of course, assuming the downtime is still ongoing. Uh, on the billing side, uh, Think about the necessity to capture billing information during a downtime. Uh, a downtime can have a negative impact on AR. If I'm not capturing this billing information on a timely basis, and I'm relying on those charge codes being captured at the end of the downtime event uh, and being pushed into billing, it could create delays in, in, in uh, uh, reimbursement for those, uh, for those charges. That may not be an issue for the organization, uh, in which case then you could certainly use the same sort of uh, note capture that you're doing for the clinical side to deal with the billing as well. And those codes get put into the system when uh, when your uh, EHR and PM is available again. If it is an issue for the practice, do I want to think about a mechanism to capture those charges electronically during uh, the downtime so that they can be pushed back in the moment the system's available again and, and my AR process uh, continue smoothly. So there could be some negative impacts of the downtime on the uh, on the financial side as well. And so you may want to mitigate and reduce uh, those impacts through your downtime solution and your plan for dealing with that. Okay, so my uh, my plan was was excellent. I uh, dealt with the downtime. I communicated to my staff. Uh, that, that everything was down. The clinical teams rolled into their downtime processes. They used the appropriate tools for dealing with that downtime. Uh, and now my EHR is back. My, uh, my communications have been restored. My server is running again, whatever uh, the downtime scenario was. How do I roll back uh, to the EHR after the downtime? What are the things that I need to consider when doing that? Um, first thing, back to my communication. I got to let my staff know. I got to notify the staff that the EHR is up and available um, so that I can then start the process of rolling back uh, to the EHR. You want to sequence your roles coming back into the in line using the EHR. Uh, so depending on your organization, this could be organization wide, it could be department wide, uh, depending on, on, on how you're, uh, you're set up, what makes the most sense uh, for the organization. Do I start with uh, registration and scheduling, then I bring clinical, and then I bring financial uh, back online? Uh, is it okay? Am I small enough for an organization I can do all three together? What makes sense for the, the organization? What you don't want to happen is you don't want partial uh, information. So if I'm doing it department-wide, I don't want some of my providers in the department still using my downtime for charting, and some of my providers going into the EHR and charting there. And the reason for that is in terms of your oversight after the fact, right? You want to be able to make sure that whatever process you're running uh, to ensure that data is in the appropriate place uh, is not hampered by the fact that you've got sort of the split process in place uh, uh, in, in given departments. So if you can account for the entire uh, department or the entire organization uh, at, at one time, that will really make your life easier uh, post downtime and dealing with with the data flow there, so it could be depart. Uh, you know, it could be uh, work workflow wise. So uh, all my uh, check-in staff in my uh, uh, family medicine department, for example, is back online and using the system. Uh, and then 20 minutes later, all my providers roll on. Whatever makes sense uh, for the organization that way. You just don't want a haphazard approach where some people are using the system and some people aren't and then it creates uh, sort of a nightmare from an oversight perspective and making sure that you know every patient's uh, data is accounted for in the EHR system at the end of the day because that's what you really want to happen when when everything is complete and that kind of leads to our next and last process which is updating the data in the EHR after the downtime 
And so the first thing that you have is this documentation that you've captured, uh, whether those are those paper uh, documents or electronic documents, those things can be brought back into the EHR. Uh, it may not be a sufficient note in your EHR system, depending on what your, uh, your forms capture. It may still require some work by uh, the, uh, the providers to complete uh, the progress note, if you will, for that visit. But if it's a, if it's paper documentation, you can certainly scan that in, uh, make that part of the patient's chart. Uh, if they're electronic forms, those could come in electronically uh, into the patient's record uh, and be dealt with. If you don't have a mechanism to uh, to bring those in electronically, you could try importing them in. You could try worst case scenario print and scanning them in uh, to the EHR. Certainly not a recommended route, but if that's what it takes to get that into the EHR. Uh, that's certainly an option as well, uh, but but just keep in mind that you got to make sure that uh, that that process meets your requirements for your for your notes. And if it doesn't, what am, what does my staff have to do to augment that uh, to deal with with creating that progress note in uh, in my EHR? Uh, you'll have to do discrete data entry into the EHR. Uh, things like putting in appointments, vitals, orders. Uh, medications, there could be a number of other things that that, that may need to go in there. Uh, really need to look at this from the lens of your quality reporting perspective. What are the discrete data elements that I need to have available uh, in my EHR so that I can report on that data, I can make that data available uh, through my quality reporting mechanisms, and I'm not losing out because I have this downtime. Right? So I want to make sure that I'm capturing uh, the necessary uh, information back into my EHR. A charge capture uh, back in, so if I was not using some sort of a charge capture mechanism uh, during the downtime, I need to capture those charges. They may be on that form uh, that I scanned in or brought in electronically. That needs to be translated into codes in my in my system. If I did capture them uh, electronically do the, during the downtime, are those charges pushed back in uh, to my PM system, so they're available for my billers uh, to be able to send those claims out. And then finally, what kind of reports do I need uh, to check that necessary data is back in the EHR? Uh, this is critically important from your data quality perspective. Uh, it's it's what drives that rollback procedure uh, that we talked about a little earlier. Whatever your reporting process is, uh, to making sure that that data is available in your EHR environment, you want to make sure that that's compliant with my rollback process, right? They work hand in hand. I don't want a rollback process that's going to make my uh, reporting uh, on the back end more difficult. I want that to, to facilitate my reporting on the back end so that I'm able to identify the holes in my environment and I'm able to deal with whoever needs to, to rectify those holes. Uh, so that I, I have appropriate quality reporting and I have uh, the necessary information at the most basic level, uh, you know, the necessary uh, information legally documented in my medical record for that patient uh, for the visit that, that occurred that day. Uh, and then sort of going up from there to deal with all of the ancillary uh, quality reporting and other metrics that you need to be able to derive uh, from, that, uh, uh, from that EHR data. So let's uh, let's recap through uh, our our discussion here today. Uh, so uh, the first critical item is start your downtime planning process now if you haven't already. Uh, downtime is a when, not an if. It's going to happen. Uh, it will happen on planned outages. You're going to have updates that need to go in. I'm sure you've already dealt with a number of them, uh, and uh, and having a formal process. Uh, to be able to deal with those uh, those planned uh, downtimes is great. And you're going to have unplanned downtimes as well. Um, you're you're going to have outages. You're going to have connectivity outages uh, that, that occur that are going to make, make your users unable to access uh, their EHR. And, uh, and, and so I can deal with it. A robust downtime plan helps define your technology plan. So if I have the process in place to deal with certain types of outages, that may uh, uh, influence my technology plan in terms of how I deploy my solution. 
right? We used to always say in uh, the disaster recovery world that uh, you you know you have the 99.999, and how many nines do I want uh, in terms of redundancy? And every nine that I add adds costs uh, uh, to my solution, and incrementally those costs increase as I'm adding more nines uh, there. So if I have a robust enough downtime plan, I may not need as many nines after the decimal point uh, in my redundancy equation uh, because I can deal with those uh, outages that might occur uh, with my robust downtime plan. So, so it, it will go hand in hand with your disaster recovery planning in order to deal with that. Do I have a downtime plan, which really is your business continuity plan, right? What is my business gonna do uh, in the event of an outage? Most outages aren't going to require your disaster recovery plan to kick in. They're not sufficient enough uh, to warrant a disaster recovery plan to kick in. Uh, but if if it is an outage that requires that, is my downtime plan robust enough that I can uh, uh, survive until that disaster recovery plan comes online? So that kind of goes hand in hand with, with those decisions. Make sure you implement the tools needed for your downtime plan. Um, once you've d defined what those are, get them set up, get them put in place, test the plan and the tools, I should say here, and make changes when necessary. This is going to be an evolving uh, process. Your downtime plan is going to change over time as tools become available or data needs uh, become available. You may add services to your uh, organization that have different uh, data requirements that you now need to uh, include in your downtime plan. So having a uh, periodic testing process can can illuminate those issues uh, as you deal with them. Uh, when you go in to test the plan and you have that aha moment of, oh, wait a minute, we started uh, seeing patients of this type and we need this additional data for those patients so that you can go back in and modify that downtime plan so you're not finding that out when the systems are not available. Make sure that plan is available to everyone when your EHR is down. Uh, it is not something you're using on a daily basis. Your, your staff is not gonna be able to remember everything that they need to do uh, in that downtime in terms of accessing uh, systems or where uh, data is gonna be available to them, where these uh, forms for note capture, things like that are gonna be available. You wanna make sure that that information is easy to disseminate to your team. Uh, in the event of an outage, they have that available at their fingertips. Uh, we, we talked about testing the tools periodically that are being used uh, and make sure your plan addresses data getting back into the EHR. Uh, you don't want to have uh, holes in your in your data reporting for quality purposes, uh, for, for uh, those of us that have to do HEDIS type reporting. Uh, you wanna make sure that, that every visit that you're doing is counting appropriately. So you want to make sure that the appropriate discrete uh, data elements are available in your EHR as well. So make that part of your plan so everyone's aware of what they need to do. If it's going back in and scanning that paper form and then putting in meds and allergies and orders, for example, then, then that needs to be laid out to your team so they're aware of everything that needs to happen in that process. I got a couple of resources here. As uh, Holly said earlier, you're going to get a copy of these slides. Uh, I think these are really two really good uh, uh, resources in terms of being able to plan uh, for uh, a downtime. Uh, the SAFER uh, publication from ONC uh, I think is really useful with some worksheets that are available in there for your organization to go through. These are really good planning tools uh, for, for planning a downtime. And then the uh, downtime planning and medical practices by Ahima is, uh, I think, useful as well. It kind of talks about uh, some of the stuff that we talked about today, but goes into a lot more detail uh, around that. So check those out when you get the slides, and uh, uh, and hopefully you can use those along with this information to, uh, to start setting up that formal downtime process uh, so that you're able to deal with these issues. Okay, with that, uh, let's open the floor to any questions. All right, I do have a couple on here. Okay, what do you recommend if I have multiple EHR systems across my organization? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So you, you really need to look at workflow by 
uh, EHR system. It's not going to be a one size fits all. The tools that are available are going to be different based on the EHR systems. Uh, it would certainly uh, uh, help the organization from a ease of deployment perspective if you can find uh, tools that work with with the different uh, systems that you have. But but that may not be a possibility. So you need to be prepared for supporting different processes. Uh, with regards to different EHRs. You're already doing that today with the EHRs themselves. And so this is sort of just an extension of that, of potentially having different downtime procedures uh, based on each of the EHR systems. The You you may find, uh, you know, as we talked about at the beginning, in terms of uh, defining uh, the downtime events that, that I need to, uh, to be prepared for, those may vary by EHR, especially if one of your EHR systems is hosted locally. The other one is a cloud-based system. Uh, you know, you may be dealing with two different set of uh, situations that are going to cause downtimes, and so you may have to plan uh, for both and deal with both. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. The next one is: It better to spend more on a DR and shorter RPO RTO, or on a solution that covers the gap in the downtime? Yeah, so uh, the like I said, most downtimes that you run into are not going to spin up your DR solution. Right? You're, if if your your uh, communication goes down in your environment, you're not going to spin up DR as a result of that. Um, so, it, I guess the way I would answer this question is, you need a robust downtime to deal with those situations that aren't going to involve DR. So it doesn't even come into discussion in terms of the RPO of your downtime, of your sorry, not downtime, your disaster solution. Um, and then if I've made those investments to deal with that, uh, with those situations, does that help me in my disaster side to be able to address the RPO accordingly? So uh, if I have a robust downtime plan in place uh, and that I'm confident can allow my team to function for four hours, eight hours, whatever makes sense. Then can I come up with uh, use that to influence my my disaster recovery plan? Uh, they they do go hand in hand, uh, and the downtime will kick in while the disaster recovery plan is being spun up, and so that RPO is important as I'm uh, uh, doing my downtime planning. But you got to keep in mind that a lot of the downtime events aren't going to spin up your disaster recovery plan. They're not gonna be uh, sufficient enough, especially planned downtimes. I'm doing system upgrades, I'm doing a hardware fix or something like that. You may not, it may not warrant the disaster recovery plan kicking into place. Okay, thank you. Next question, how do you recommend improving our data accessibility during downtime if our data source is our cloud-based EHR? So, so there are tools that are available that can create local storages of information. So you could have um, data that's stored locally as part of your internal data store, um, your, your internal data center, I should say. Uh, where I'm bringing information from the cloud locally uh, to be made available to me in, in the event of an outage. You'll have to work with your vendor and potentially some third-party groups uh, to determine what uh, tools I have available for that scenario. And then you'll have to look at, again, the need and the cost-benefit ratio of deploying tools like that in terms of, of uh, my most likely points of failure. With a cloud-based uh, environment, uh, whether it's a true cloud solution or you have a cloud uh, uh, or a private cloud storage where you're, where you're using a Citrix or a, a remote desktop to access a, uh, uh, an EHR system, generally the most likely point of failure is communication. Right? The redundancy that's built into these cloud environments uh, make those that infrastructure pretty robust. And so more often than not, when you're unable to access that environment, it's because you can't connect to it, uh, because there's some outage of connectivity uh, between your site and the and the cloud environment. Uh, and so having something locally uh, is what we would recommend in that scenario. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, next uh, question, some groups print out schedules and chart summaries. Is this not a valid plan? Sure, it's absolutely valid. Uh, you may need to increase what you what you capture there uh, if it's not enough data. So as we talked about in terms of defining the data that's required, if that chart summary uh, contains everything that's needed to be able to see the patient, that's certainly a valid approach to doing it. It could be cost prohibitive in the long run um, if uh, printing this information out. Do you have a security uh, requirement that you'll need to put in place on those chart summaries? So you got to make sure your policies and procedures handles that, uh, so they're being accounted for. But certainly, uh, uh, doing a process like that is a valid approach uh, for dealing with the downtime, uh, as long as you've got the other pieces in place as well. How do I capture information in the outage? How is that information going to go back into the EHR uh, when connectivity is restored? Uh, so, so yeah, that definitely valid. Look at it from a cost benefit perspective. Uh, Printing those summaries uh, eats up cost over time. And so is, is that the best way for me to do it? Okay, I have one more. Uh, can the same solution be used for both planned and unplanned downtime? Absolutely, it should be uh, uh, the same solution because you're going to be uh, grabbing information uh, from there. The the one scenario where you may uh, have some uh, uh, pause is hardware related planned outages uh, because if my uh, downtime is located in the same environment as my uh, uh, EHR and the hardware related uh, planned downtime is going to affect that accessibility that may be a problem uh, but in that scenario um, it, it really doesn't meet the requirement of dealing with your most common points of failure because having your downtime and your EHR in the same location uh, will generally fail uh, due to most common points of failure analysis. So uh, usually you would deploy that scenario with your downtime sitting uh, externally and, and that wouldn't be a problem there. So uh, yeah, you should be able to handle the plan and the unplanned together with the same solution. Okay, thank you. That is all I have in the questions. So uh, uh, thank you, Vic, today for your presentation and thank you all for attending. Um, again, to close out the session, you will be receiving an email with a link to the recording. If you have any questions or need some further assistance, feel free to reach out to your uh, rep or account manager directly, or you can always send an, an email to info at emedapps.com or info at medtechsolutions.com. Uh, we'd be happy to help you. Hope everyone has a great day, and again, thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone.